And what happens? Your legs get tired. Specifically, the quadriceps, hamstrings, and calf muscles get tired. Do a lot of heavy lifting, and your back muscles get tired. Hold a baby in your arms for a long time, and your arm muscles fatigue. That's what muscles do. If they are used for a long time, they get tired. Use them long enough, and you won't be able to use them at all until they recover. So, let me ask you this. Has your tongue ever gotten tired? Even just a little bit? Have you ever talked for a long time and thought, man, my tongue is worn out? No. Your throat may be sore, causing your voice to get raspy, but your tongue can just keep going and going and going. And we all know people who take advantage of that fact. Yeah, later in the afternoon to start the napping. You walk into the room with them jaws a flapping. You keep that motor mouth moving morning, noon, and night. Keep a dog, baby, make my hair turn white. You talk too much. Of all the muscles in your body, your tongue never experiences fatigue. That's a fact. That's because your tongue isn't one large muscle, it's actually eight different muscles. More precisely, it's eight matching pairs of muscles, with eight controlling one side of the tongue and eight the other, so 16 total. These muscles do different things, but every action can be performed by more than one of the muscle groups. So, when one of the muscle groups gets tired, other muscle fibers take over to perform the same tasks and let the others rest. This redundancy means that your tongue never fatigues. Four of the muscle groups attach to parts of the head and neck and control the in, out, up and down, and side to side movements of the tongue. The other four muscle groups attach to each other, controlling the shape of the tongue, lengthening, shortening, flattening, curling, and rounding of the tongue. Unlike most of the muscles, the tongue muscles aren't anchored to bone, thus controlling the movement of the skeleton. Rather, the tongue muscles are intertwined and work together to control the whole tongue. It's the same way octopus tentacles or an elephant's trunk are structured. You may have heard that the tongue is the strongest muscle in the body. Well, again, it's not a single muscle, but a system of muscles. But even then, it's not the strongest muscle, not by a long shot. But it is the mightiest muscle in the body. That's what James calls it. Let's take a look at James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with the bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships. Though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body, sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creatures, can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless the Lord and Father, and with it, we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. Okay, I was being kind when I said that James called the tongue the mightiest of the muscles. What he actually called it is an uncontrollable fire, a world of iniquity, a stain on the entire body, a restless evil, and a deadly poison. 
dang, something got under his skin. Or more likely, someone, multiple someones. When you read the entire letter, you can kind of piece together the people who have got him so fired up. They are apparently some wealthy people who have been teaching everyone else in the church that using your wealth to help people who don't deserve it, like, you know, widows and orphans, is in fact denying your salvation, which comes by faith, by believing, and not by anything that you actually do, like, you know, helping widows and orphans in their distress. That's what they were teaching, because that's the way they were living, and everyone likes to use God to justify what they want to do. They wanted to keep their wealth for themselves and not feel any obligation or responsibility towards others in society. So they taught a theology that relieved them of any responsibility for others and in fact made them appear more righteous because their wealth was a sign of God's blessing, while a widow's poverty or an orphan's parentlessness was a sign of some defect in them or their husbands or parents or probably all of those things. That's what they were teaching, which got James all riled up. So, you know, don't do that. My observation is that most biblical interpreters treat this passage in isolation from the rest of the letter. Like, James has multiple separate subjects he wants to talk about, and this is one of them. So, he starts out telling people to endure persecution with joy, and then he moves on to the subject of being doers of the word and not just hearers, which leads to the section about, you know, faith without works is, is dead. And when he's done with that, he deals with the problem of gossip in the church here in chapter 3. From there, he moves on to the factions that have developed in the church and the disputes among the factions with an appeal to church unity. And finally, in chapter 5, he yells at the rich people for a while for being arrogant before he then ends with a few thoughts on the power of prayer. So that's what, seven things he wanted to cover in his letter? And he could have covered them in any order. This is just the order that he placed them in. I don't think so. I think he had a large point that he was driving toward that I just described. And in all of these sub points, though valid subjects for discussion on their own, all work together to make his large point. Having said that, it's worth looking at the smaller point about the tongue. After all, just because a point is smaller doesn't mean that it's small. Not if the larger point is actually huge. Less huge is still huge, right? And how we speak to each other, what we say, and how we say it is huge. The way James puts it, we can bless or we can curse. We can start a forest fire that consumes everything and everyone in its path, or we can use a fire to cook a meal to cure someone's hunger. We can use words to build someone up or use words to tear them down. And we've all seen both at work. We've seen children physically wilt when berated by a parent. We've seen teenagers who've been bullied into suicide by things their peers have said to or about them. I mean, most bullying is not physical. Kids aren't so much getting beat up physically, they're getting beat up verbally. And we've seen the toxic effects of social media. It can be a tool for connecting people in a good way, but it's also been a tool that fascist groups use to disguise their hateful ideas and make them seem mainstream. I mean, blessings and curses indeed. Those are interesting ideas, blessings and curses. We take a metaphorical approach to blessings and curses. To the ancients, a blessing wasn't just something someone said to another that made them feel good about themselves and therefore blessed them. A blessing was something that was pronounced on another person and actually did something to them, regardless of how it was received. Remember when Jacob and Rebekah conspired to trick poor old Isaac with his failing eyesight into giving their firstborn blessing on the secondborn Jacob? And once the blessing was pronounced, the deed was done. When Isaac and Esau discovered the trickery, Isaac didn't say, oh, right, well, okay, everything I said to Jacob, 
I take back, I meant to say it to Esau, and so I will say it to Esau. No, when, when they discovered the treachery, they were distraught because the blessing had gone out and landed on Jacob and once out, it was out of Isaac's control. And Esau was angry out of proportion if it was just a, a bit of trickery that was easily undone. No, he set out to kill Jacob and Jacob had to run for his life. But he ran with the blessing in tow. Once blessed, he couldn't be unblessed. Similarly, cursing someone wasn't just yelling a bunch of four-letter words at them. It was something that was pronounced against them that did something to them. Someone cusses at you, you can just shrug it off if so inclined, but you couldn't shrug off a curse. It's like when the evil fairy put a curse on a young prince and he became beast in the story of Beauty and the Beast. She pronounced it and it happened. So that's what they meant, at least in the Old Testament, by blessing and cursing. And as is often the case, when the New Testament writers say something, they're usually referring to something in the Old Testament. And here, James is clearly invoking God's initial covenant with Abram, which is found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So, here are the promises and responsibilities of the covenant. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great in order that you will be a blessing to others. And those you bless, I will bless. And those who curse you, I will curse. And that way all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, notice that Abram is given the charge, the responsibility, to be a blessing to others and to bless them. And God will honor Abram's blessing and bless those he blesses. But Abram is not given the freedom or the responsibility to curse others. I mean, the formula, if it were to be consistent, should be those you bless, I will bless, and those you curse, I will curse. But it doesn't say that. It says... As you go about blessing others and being a blessing, there will be those who don't like you doing that. If you bless someone's enemy, for instance, they probably aren't going to like that. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? But the corollary is that the friend of my enemy is my enemy. So, if you bless someone's enemy, they are going to pronounce a curse on you. It's going to happen. It's just the danger of trying to bless people. And God offers his protection by saying, I will curse those who curse you. In other words, don't be stingy with your blessings out of fear of powerful people who might not want you to bless certain people, like poor people, widows and orphans who are always poor. No, be liberal in your blessings. Be prodigal, wasteful even. Just go sow your blessings widely and profligately, and let me worry about the powerful people and their curses. I will protect you. If there's any cursing to be done, I'll do it, God says. You are the blesser. It's like when, when the Lord says, vengeance is mine. He's not necessarily saying he's a vengeful God. He's saying we aren't supposed to be vengeful people. If there's any vengeance to be done, he'll do it, not you or me. And Christians aren't to be cursing people either. We're in the blessing business, and our job is to help God bring about the time when all the families of the earth will be blessed. And you know what? That's a full-time job. That's, that's an 80-hour-a-week kind of job. Ain't nobody got time to be cursing others. 
And that's what James is saying to these rich people who were teaching that it wasn't their responsibility to care for widows and orphans and other poor people. It's not their job to be a blessing. Each person is supposed to take responsibility for their own lives and bless themselves. The rich have worked hard to earn their blessings, or their fathers worked hard and passed it on, or maybe their grandfathers worked hard and passed it on, but whatever. Their families worked hard to earn their blessings, and it's not fair, it's not right for anyone to expect them to take their hard-earned blessings and redistribute them to people who don't deserve it. They, <laughs> they taught that. They, they used their words, their well-educated words, to teach a lie and pronounce a curse upon widows and orphans and other poor people. And James says to them that the moment they utter a curse, the moment they teach a lie as truth, the moment they use their tongue to set off a forest fire, or as we say, school another person, he says that they reveal that, that they really aren't part of the covenant people, because covenant people are blessers, not cursers. Covenant people only bless and leave the cursing up to God and, I guess, to unbelievers. And so we've, we've kind of come around and completed the circle with the smaller but still huge point supporting the larger and really huge point, B a blessing. That's your job. That's your responsibility. That's what you were saved for. That's the calling of a Christian. And it's a full-time job because all the families of the earth, it has a lot of families. There's no time to waste on cursing or even sitting back and not blessing. James says, no one can tame the tongue, but don't believe him because he clearly expects us to do it. He's, he's speaking out of exasperation, but he's exasperated because these people, these super Christians, have not trained and disciplined themselves to speak blessings, not curses. The way to develop a muscle is to train it through discipline and practice and hard work over a long period of time. The way to learn to be a blessing is to practice, practice, practice. And you know, sometimes the greatest blessing you can give to a person is to listen to them, which means you have to be quiet. In the first chapter, James says, you must understand this, my beloved, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. You know when you're the quickest to speak up in anger? When someone is speaking to you in anger and you feel the need to defend yourself. And again, God says, that's my job. If it needs to be done, I'll do it. You be a blessing. And oftentimes, when, a, when another person is angry, it's because no one will listen to them. They, they just want to be heard. They don't always even need you to agree with them. They just need to be heard and understood. So give your tongue a rest, not because it's tired, but because that's an expression of love. And sometimes, when we speak, we need to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, like widows and orphans who literally did not have a voice in ancient society, no one to pay attention to them except maybe negative attention, no one to speak for them. That's what James is doing here. Imagine being a widow or an orphan in that church, listening to James speak the words that they have for so long wanted to hear. What a blessing that must have been. So be a blessing. Speak blessings. Bless others. 
thus showing that you are truly part of the people who follow a Savior who stood up for those who had no standing and spoke up for those who had no voice and who took the curses of the world and turned them into blessings for all who believe and follow. Lord, when we speak without thinking, when we react with our tongues rather than with our hearts, when we dismiss others in order to elevate ourselves, we hurt people. Forgive us. James says our tongues are untamable, but it is not our tongues that need taming. It's us. James says our tongues are untamable, but it's not our tongues that need taming. It's us. So tame us. Let us submit to your taming, your training, your disciplining, your discipling. Help us to embrace our role as worldwide blessers. And if that creates enemies of some, let us bless them as well and trust in your protection. And let it start today. May we resolve to get through the rest of this day only blessing others, with no unhealthy word coming from our mouths. And if we fail, which happens when we are unskilled at something, assure us of your forgiveness as we try again tomorrow, and the next day, and the next. We pray this in the name of the one who looked down from the cross at his crucifiers and prayed a blessing upon them. The name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>